Um, okay, thank you all for coming. I'd also like to make a few thank yous. So thank you to Jean-Michel and to Laura, who have, uh, who have welcomed me here very warmly. Um, I also want to thank the Robart Center for Canadian Studies. Um, that has been very kind to me and very generous uh, uh, with its resources while I've been here. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Lorna Marston for her support of me and the center. I'd like to prof uh, also thank Professor Kim Bird, uh, my collaborator and also supporter uh, for my work here at York. Um, and finally, I'd like to, um, uh, uh, again, thank the center. And I'm excited by the possibilities of having collaboration between um, the UCD Center for Canadian Studies and uh, uh, the Robart Center for Canadian Studies. So um, today's talk is a, is a truncated version of the first chapter of my current bro book project, which is titled Political Stages, Gay Theatre in Canada in Toronto, 1967 to 1985. The book charts the history of gay male theatre in Toronto from, the, from 1967, um, the years just prior to the decriminalization of homosexuality in Canada, to 1985, the first years of the AIDS crisis and the year when Section 15 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, Equality Rights, took effect. I conclude in 1985 um, with these two occurrences as they irrevoc irrevocably altered the grounds on which gay activism took place in Canada. And during this 20 year period, paradigmatic shifts occurred in Toronto's gay community and in its theater industry. Toronto's gay community transformed itself from an almost entirely <coughs> subaltern network into a visible and politicized community, while its self-styled alternative or alternate theaters similarly moved from the margins of the theater industry into the center of theatrical production in the city. The alternative theaters were a countrywide movement that sought to decolonize theater, um, that is, stop producing British and American plays, by fostering what, was, what they called at the time indigenous theater. T together, these two movements, the rise of gay activism and the alternatives, constitute the backdrop for the emergence of gay theater as a form of theater and a social formation in Toronto. But as I'll demonstrate through my discussion today, um, a discussion of Herbert's experience, the history of gay theater is not straightforward. How politicized gay theater emerged in Toronto, uh, the role it played in the broader re reformation of gay identity and community, and the ways in which gay liberation and the alternative theater movements intersected in its production um, are the primary questions that my book answers through its construction of an analytical history of gay theater in Toronto. So in today's talk, I will be looking at uh, chapter one, um, what I'm calling theatrical protests before decriminalization, fortune and, men's eyes, fortune and men's eyes at Toronto Central Library Theater. I will begin by looking at the autobiographical background um, that led Herbert to write the play and then move on to its rejection by the theater establishment in Toronto um, and its subsequent huge success in New York, which led to the New York Productions tour to Toronto. Ironically, it was rejected, became a hit in Toronto, and toured back. I will then look at the immediate political context for the New, York's, New, York, New York Productions staging at, in Toronto at the Central Library Theatre, the debates which were the debates around the trial of George Everett Clippert, which led eventually to the decriminalization of homosexuality in 1969. Finally, I'll perform uh, an analysis of the play itself that demonstrates the scathing critique the, that it mounted against the Canadian criminal justice system and Canadian society more broadly, and how its inclusion of gay men within this broader critique constituted a form of theatrical protest against the marginalization and criminalization of gay men in this period, which of course Herbert experienced firsthand. Just gotta make sure that went very good. So the good city. Um, John Jack Herbert Brundage, more widely known by his pen name John Herbert, was born in 1926. He grew up in Mount Dennis, a suburb northeast of the city, surrounded by a large and loving family. His childhood and adolescence were, in his own words, carefree, and he was a happy kid. He excelled in school and had a particular penchant for creative writing, art, music, and drama, which he felt differentiated him from his peers. Herbert began to work in the advertising department of the Timothy Eaton Company at the age of 18, coming into the city daily from his home in Mount Dennis. He was young, enthusiastic about life, art, and culture, and was seduced by the city's seemingly limitless variety. 
At this time, he also began to take part in the city's male homosexual subculture. He was very flamboyant. He was, in, again, quote, madly in love with drag, and his sartorial flair was influenced by contemporary feminine icons such as Joan Crawford, Betty Davis, Rita, and Rita Hayworth. In drag, he would often go with friends to the Devon restaurant, which only closed in 2004, or to one of the bars where other queer men socialized. He and his friends, he would later recall, would spend all the money they earned at their day jobs on dresses, gloves, hats, and makeup to wear out in the evenings. The homosexual male subculture in Toronto in the late 1940s and early 1950s was small, marginal, and segregated along, line, along the interconnected lines of class, sex, gender performance, and race. The subculture was, however, again quoting Herbert, a community, which was very, a very, quote, edgy and dangerous community. The dangers members faced were not simply being ostracized by family, friends, employers, or landlords should their sexual orientation be revealed, though these were real fears. It was rather the, the, the physical violence and or possibility of arrest and incarceration that were the greatest threats to their personal liberty and security. Gay men who dressed and acted femininely were, were what Esther Newton in in the American context calls street fairies, although Herbert always referred to himself and other men like him as queens. These men were more visible as queers um, than their more masculine counterparts, resulting in major differences in how they lived their social and sexual lives. According to Newton, street fairies were often jobless men who, who built their lives around gay cultures, living at least partially outside the law, and playing important roles in fighting for gay turf. Their feminine gender performance meant that these individuals were the most visible face of queer subcultures in a time of virulent homophobia, and because of this, they were often victims of harassment and acts of violence at the hands of both police and other citizens. In the fall of 1947, <clears throat> Herbert was victim to, of, a, to, of two youths who attempted to rob him. However, during the, the altercation, police came on the scene and the two boys quickly claimed that Herbert had solicited sex from them. The boys testified to this effect in court and Herbert was convicted of gross indecency. He was sentenced to two three-month terms to be served consecu consecutively in the reformatory at Guelph, Ontario. He was 20 at the time of his first conviction and celebrated his 21st birthday during his incarceration. After his discharge from Guelph in, Guelph in 1948, Herbert was arrested once again in the spring of the same year. This time dressed in drag, he was found in a parked car in Rosedale with a man who had picked him up on Church Street. In an effort to convict Herbert, two, in an effort to convict Herbert, two of the morality squad officers promised the man they found in the car with him that he would go free if he would testify against Herbert. Quote, they threatened the man into giving evidence against me on the charge of gross indecency, end quote. Uh, Herbert would go on and say, quote, they promised, when it, they promised when it was too late to help my case that he would go free, uncharged, if he would sign a paper saying that I asked him for money. The, the bullied, frightened man did so to save himself, and I was sentenced to two months imprisonment at Mimico Reformatory. With self-righteous self admonitions toward me on the subject of my sexual preference, the judge, sounding all the world like an evangelical minister, contem condemned me to the hell of Mimico for the summer. And hell is what Mimico proved to be. During his time at Guelph and in Mimico, Herbert was raped and physically abused. At this time, corporal punishment was still permissible within penal institutions in Canada, and Herbert recounts being clamped at the ankles and waist to a machine and whipped, and that he stopped counting at 10 lashes. When Herbert left Mimico, the Mimico Reformatory, he was an ex-con, socially disgraced, and his personal life was in shambles, professional life, excuse me, was in shambles. In the years following, he took odd jobs in a number of cities and towns, working as a tobacco sh shipper in Toronto, a construction worker um, in Labrador, a builder of the Winni Winnipeg Dam, a carnival spieler, and a store clerk in Chicago. Such were the effects of his ex-con status that Herbert, 
who was a man of many talents and intellectual abilities, was forced to engage in provisional and unskilled la labor. His itinerant and marginal lifestyle did, however, allow him to encounter many ways of living and have supplied an outsider's view of the world. For example, while working in Chicago in the early 1950s, he participated in that city's black gay drag culture. Asked by a, a drag queen friend, he performed at a bar called Joe's Deluxe on the south side of the, the city and was the fir first white person to perform in the club. An intelligent and unprejudiced man, Herbert must have been sensitive to the various kinds of oppression, classism, racism, homophobia, and transphobia that would have characterized the lives of his peers at Joe's, at Joe's Deluxe. He must also have felt the tremors of agitation presaging the civil rights movement, which would begin in a few short years. Herbert also worked uh, professionally as a female impersonator, um, traveling across Canada in 1953 as Carol Desmond, his drag per persona, up until his death, in, a, in his death, uh, in a burlesque show that was called Paris After Midnight. He procured this job through uh, Alan Maloney, who was an early Toronto drag queen called Brandy. Herbert knew Maloney from the time he, they served together at Guelph, and the character of Queenie in Fortune and Men's Eyes is based on him. While on tour, he and Maloney passed as women both on stage and off. Their experiences, these experiences of bravery, fun, and danger brought about an awakening in, her, awakening in Herbert's consciousness. Speaking of the tour with Maloney, when he lived much of his life as a woman, Herbert remembered that it was a quote, it was about that time something in me something in me said, God, isn't it good to just be oneself? After in 1955, after nearly a decade of uh, a decade of moving from place to place, Herbert dared to return to his home in Toronto. With the encouragement of his sister Nana Brendage, he decided to pursue pursue theater seriously. He studied acting at Dora Maver Moore's New Play Society, um, and the city, which was the city's premier acting school from 1955 to 1958. Ballet with the internationally renowned National Ballet School from 58 to 60. And in the 1960s, he would found, a number, uh, found and run a number of amateur theater companies in the city, producing his own plays and those of others. That's Herbert in a, a kind of uh, striptease uh, that he did. Um, and that's Alan Maloney as Brandy. So the nature of the political awakening that Herbert experienced in, in the beginning of the 1950s, and which expresses itself in his theatrical work in the 1960s and 70s, was baldly revealed in an interview he gave in 1968. In the, this interview, he cites his oppression by corrupt social forces as the primary motivation of his work as an artist. Quote, their system has bred a social critic. And as long as I can sharpen a pencil, I'll continue to write out against it, against it. They'll have to hang me to stop me. In the same interview, he clearly states his, his personal, excuse me, he clearly states his political position on the still criminal status of homosexuality in Canada. In sexual relationships, personal choice is the most important thing. The prison condition, which allows no choice, and the laws on the books which create such conditions for homosexuals are the most perverse of all. As Herbert implies, it is, it, is not too much, it is not too far a stretch to consider what he calls the prison condition beyond the walls of the penitentiaries and into a society that continued to criminalize homosexuals. Indeed, Herbert made, made explicit his understanding of the relationship between Canadian society and the prison world he depicts in Fortune. As I see it, in this small setting of a reform institution cell block, the whole political situation is intensified. The same things are wrong with our society as a whole, but they rise to the crest in the cell block. The manipulation and consuming of one human creature by another breaks through the surface. He began writing Fortune in 1963, following more than a decade of almost total silence about his prison experiences and he decided that it was time to write about, quote, the most traumatic events of my early life. Like all of his other work, it was a vehicle of social critique that sought to expose the hypocrisy of a culture that had abused, marginalized, and criminalized him. Despite his, despite his other work in theater, or perhaps because of it, because of its blatant politics, fortune was re rejected, 
by the theatre establishment in Toronto, particularly due to its representations of homosexuality and the broad power of its critique. As we will see in the next section, Fortson's de development and performance history inside Canada is drastically different from its reception and importance outside the country. These differences reveal the conservative nature of the theatre community in Toronto, especially acute around representations of homosexuality, and its unwillingness to see the marginalization and criminalization of homosexual, homosexuals as a valid political issue prior to decriminalization. So the next section is called Rejection in Toronto and the Status of Political Performance. Fortune holds a paradoxical position in the, in the canon of contemporary Canadian theatre, one that is evidenced in its inclusion in all three of the major anthologies of, of Canadian drama published since, since the 1980s, and the sparse attention it has gar garnered from both theatre practitioners and scholars in Canada. Despite its success in New York and subsequent productions in, um, in 1968 in London, um, in Paris in 1971, and its celebrity productions by Sal Minio uh, in Los Angeles and New York in 1969, and that's a young Don Johnson who was played Smitty in the play, uh, in Sal Minio's version of the play, and James Baldwin's Istan James Baldwin production of, the, of Fortune in Istanbul, Turkey in 1969-70, and being made into a film by MGM in 1971. It was not produced by a professional uh, theater in Herbert's Toronto until 1975, a full year, eight years after its production off Broadway. Neither the handful of academic papers written on Fortune nor the introductions to these three anthologies include a thoroughgoing historical explanation of the play's inability to achieve production in the 1960s. This scholarship, this scholarship has not accounted for the political, social, or historical significance of its singularly successful staging at the Central Library Theater. Fortune's depiction of its homosexual characters as cruelly marginalized victims of society, and in the case of Mona, highly moral people, was the primary reason it was rejected by the, by the Toronto theater community. That this was the case is most clearly evidenced in its rejection by Toronto Workshop Productions, the city's most politically aligned and engaged theater. George Luscombe founded Workshop Productions in 1959, two years after his return from apprenticing at Joan Littlewood's Theatre Workshop in Stratford East, London. In 1963, under Luscombe's leadership, the company hired an ensemble of six actors, changed its name, its name to Toronto Workshop Productions, and evolved from a part-time amateur theater into a professional one. In his book on George Luscombe and Toronto Workshop Productions, Neil Carson suggests the following. From the beginning, Luscombe envisions, envisioned his new company as a part of an international contingent of artists determined to further the cause of socialism through art. He saw himself as part of a tradition which sought to bring about change by educational rather than political or revolutionary means. The function of the artist was not to get out on the hustings or to man the barricades. It was to demonstrate the social and economic laws governing society. What Theatre Workshop Productions was needed was original Canadian plays that would rip away the familiar surface of life to throw light on the ignored and unexamined corners of, Canadian, of the Canadian experience. Fortune's first draft was completed in 1963-1964 and was then called the Christmas Concert. And it was sent to Lescombe, who knew of Herbert's other socially and politically critical plays, Private Club, which is about anti-Semitism, and Household God, which is about materialism. If Carson's analysis of Lescombe and Toronto Workshop Productions is correct, Fortune arrived at the theater at just the perfect time. Just as the company was attaining professional status, a powerful new play by a Canadian playwright which launched a complex and rigorous critique of Canadian society, including a class analysis, fell directly, fell directly into Luscombe's lap. Toronto Workshop Production was the ideal setting to develop and stage this political play, which would educate audiences about the heinous practices fostered by the criminal justice system. It would demonstrate how the prison system served to oppress racial and ethnic minorities, the, the lower and criminalized classes, and homosexuals, as well as encourage their re-victimization through recidivism. 
Fortune is the kind of play that Carson argues Toronto Workshop Productions was looking for. It exposes a shady corner of Canadian life, treating it as a microcosm for Canadian society, and it represents the real corruption and hypocrisy that under, underpinned our conceptions of justice and morality. Despite the play's seemingly perfect timing, its flawless fit within the theatre's political commitments, and Toronto Workshop's production's stated desire to foster new Canadian plays, Fortune was flatly refused by Luscombe. According to Herbert, when he presented Luscombe with the play, Luscombe suggested, quote, it would have better been set in a sauna than a prison. Carson argues, that, Carson argues the primary reason for Fortune's rejection was its realism, which he suggests was foreign to Toronto Workshop production style. But he also rather diplomatically adds that, quote, felt, Luscombe felt personally uncomfortable with the play's homosexual theme. Regardless of whether or not the reason for Luscombe's rejection was aesthetic, or as Carson suggests, his own homophobia, the fact that the city's most ideologically aligned theater, whose stated commitments were to staging politically conscious plays, would neither support nor produce fortune, in indicates not only the homophobia of the theater community in Toronto, but that homosexuality was not considered an important political issue in this moment. Indeed, it seems that Portions in Portions, it seems that Fortune's inclusion of homosexuality as a political issue prevented its staging in Toronto and its broad critique of Canadian society at Toronto Workshop Productions. Eventually, Fortune made its way into the hands of Nathan Cohen, theater critic at, the, at, Toronto, at Toronto Daily Star. Cohen liked the play, but gloomily predicted that it would never receive a public performance in Toronto. Cohen, sent, Cohen sent, then sent the play to David Rothenberg, a press agent in New York, who was so excited by it that he instantly began to seek out producers. But like Herbert, Rothenberg found that none were interested. Unwilling to take no for an answer, Rothenberg, Rothenberg um, proposed that, the play, that he produce the play himself. He found a number of backers, uh, took a bank loan, and invested his own savings to produce the play. Ironically, it was the social and political implications of a broken criminal justice system, which creates criminals and criminalizes queers, the very things that had killed the play in Toronto, which fired Rothenberg's and others' desire to see it stage. David Roth, uh, excuse me, Rothenberg had the play workshopped in 1966 at the Actors Studio, led by Lee Strasberg. Here, Fortune, found, Fortune finally fell into the hands of an artist who thought its representations of homosexuality and prison life were important for their honesty and realism. Strindberg, excuse me, Strasberg, Strasberg thought Fortune was a unique play that would open doors onto previously taboo subjects. The play premiered at the Actors Playhouse in, Feb in New York in February 1967, and the year of Canada's centenary when, Canada's, when Canadian culture was being spectacularly celebrated across the country, Fortune had to go to New York to find a theater community to support it. It ran off Broadway for over a year, a first for a Canadian play, and the production was such a success that it toured to several cities in the United States and Canada, including the production at the Central Library Theater. Fortune was published by Grove Press, which is the image we see behind us, in 1967, and would go on to sell more copies than any other Canadian play, a, a title which I think it still holds to this day. So the next section is called Theatrical Protest uh, Before Gay Liberation. The immediate political context for Fortune's production at the Central Library Theater was the, were the, was the sensational trials of Everett George Clippert. In 1965, during the course of, a, uh, um, of an arson investigation, Clipper was questioned by RCMP officers. He told the authorities that he had engaged in sexual acts with other men four times, all of which were consensual, consensual and performed in private, since he had arrived in Pine Point Northwest Ter Territories from Calgary a few years earlier. Based on these admissions, he was convicted of four counts of gross indecency and sentenced to three years for each count, 12 years total. A repeat offender, having already served four years in Calgary in a Calgary prison on the same charge, Clippert was psychologically assessed by doctors who concluded that while he posed no danger to anyone, he was likely to reoffend upon release. Based on this clinical analysis, 
his previous conviction, and the laws still current in the criminal code, Clippert was deemed, was deemed a, a dangerous sexual offender by the territorial court on the 9th of March, 1966, a sentence that potentially incarcerated him for the rest of his natural life. Shocked and dismayed, Clippert appealed the, the decision, taking his case all the way to the, the, to the Supreme Court of Canada. In the interim, the first homophile organization in Canada, the Association for Social Knowledge, suggested in its June 1967 newsletter that, quote, if the Clippert conviction is upheld by the Supreme Court, it means that any practicing homosexual in Canada can be convicted be, of being a dangerous, dangerous sexual offender and sentenced indefinitely, end quote. As, as extreme as such a prediction may sound, the Supreme Court of Canada upheld the territorial court's ruling in a three to two decision on the 7th of November, 1967. The Clipper decision created an uproar of debate uh, in the media and parliament. In reaction to the decision, then Justice Minister, must, Justice Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau famously said, the state has no business in the bedrooms of the nation. It was the fallout from the Clippert decision that led to the Liberal government that led the Liberal government to include the decriminalization of homosexual acts between two consenting adults in private in, in Bill C-150, its omnibus bill, which liberalized several sections of the criminal code and which was passed into law in May 1969. So less than three weeks before the Supreme Court's shocking decision, Fortune in Men's Eyes opened at the Central Library Theater in Toronto, October 9, 1967, where it ran for a full 15 weeks to sold out houses. Given the nature of this prison drama, its performance at the Central, the Central Library Theater was made that much more relevant by the spectacular um, trials of Everett George Clippert. Oddly, none of the play's reviews in the city's press draw any connection or comparison between its performance and the highly publicized Clippert trial with which Fortune was surely in conversation. This is surprising because it, with its well-known subject matter, based on the autobiographical experiences of its author, and this was widely known and, and covered in the press, and with its history of rejection in, uh, by the Toronto theater establishment due to its homosexual themes, and with its unprecedented success in New York, the Fortune's performance at the Central Library Theater is the most important con public condemnation of the criminalized and pathologized status of homosexuals in Canada to this time. And yet, the failure of critics to connect the play to the Clippert case is also not remarkable, given the extent to which the rights of homosexuals were not yet considered a political issue in the popular consciousness. Two years before the Stonewall riots in New York, four years before the first gay rights rally in, in Canada, which was held in Ottawa in 1971, and just three years after the establishment of Canada's earliest homophile association, Fortune staging at the Central Library Theatre in many ways inaugurates the use of the theatre by an openly gay man to engage with the realities of gay life and to protest their, the criminalization, marginalization, and oppression that he, as a gay man, ex himself experienced. Fortune's action powerfully displays the criminal justice displays how the criminal justice system, charged with administering justice and reforming criminals, actually creates criminals through its abuses of power and through laws that unjustly criminalize various marginalized populations. In the years before the advent of gay liberation activism in Canada, Fortune's unambiguous inclusion of homosexual men among those who are victimized by the criminal justice system constitutes a seminal and dramatic act of theatrical protest at the Central Library Theatre. Indeed, it's, it, indeed, its representation of the unjust stigmatization and oppression of homosexuals by the state as an issue of political importance, combined with Herbert's own, own open protests against the laws still on the books, contributes to uh, the, the emergence of gay liber the gay liberation movement in Canada. So, uh, Fortune's plot presents four young men, Smitty, Rocky, Queenie, and Mona, and their guard, Holyface, in a Canadian reformatory, what Herbert calls prep school for the penitentiary. It centers on Smitty, 
who enters the prison, a moral person at the outset of the play. He's convicted of stealing his father's car to help his mother get away from, her, uh, from him. He's an abusive father. He's an abusive husband, excuse me. And, it is, and he is transformed into an embittered, violent, and criminal, a violent criminal by the play's end, set on revenge against the society that has wronged him. In one of the plot's most powerful moments, Smitty is violently forced into the prison's inequitable hierarchy of aggressive old, old men and passive boys by Rocky, a hardened repeat offender whose mother and father are also criminals. Rocky init initially cajoles and jokes with Smitty to persuade him to act as his boy, but when this does not work, he violently rapes him into submission. Rocky succeeds in subjugating Smitty, but only temporarily. Quickly learning some difficult lessons, Smitty works deals with an absent power broker called Baldy, and then offers to become Mona's old man. Mona, who is also a first-time offender, refuses Smitty's offer because he believes the prison system's syst prison's system of power to be nothing less than soul-destroying. Fostering no alliances and being without any political influence, Mona is what is, derm what is called public property, the lowest level in the prison hierarchy, a title that denotes neither owning nor being owned by anyone, and therefore having no, no recourse to retribution should he be victimized. During his incarceration, Mona has been the victim of a gang rape by his fellow inmates and by corporal punishment by the prison's guards. He explains his decision to remain public property by telling Smitty that he must continue to hold, quote, the right to say or be anything or everything or nothing to myself. Smitty can't understand why Mona would choose to go on being the victim of violence when he is offering him protection and greater access to material goods within the prison, the prison system. The thoughtful youth explains his reasoning by having Smitty read Shakespeare's 29th sonnet, from which the play takes its title. Through the sonnet, Mona conveys the idea that he, he and Smitty must find ways to transcend their outcast state by not accepting or identifying with the degrading roles prescribed by the prison's corrupt culture. Instead, instead, they must find ways to nurture love and mutual respect where possible and enact a kind of non-participation akin to civil disobedience by existing outside the prison's power structure wherever and whenever possible. In reading the sonnet, Mona suggests that while the, the, the world has deemed them, deemed them criminals and perverts, this will only be true if they themselves accept, this, this, accept and affirm this nomination through their own performative enactments, a powerful assertion for a gay man in the day, days before gay liberation. Their happy moment is in, interrupted, however, first by, a, by the violent entrance of Queenie and Rocky, and then by the entrance of Holyface. Fearing an alliance between Smitty and Mona, fearing that an alliance between Smitty and Mona will upset their power within the cell, Queenie and, Mo Queenie and Rocky burst in and violently separate them. When Holyface arrives on the scene, Queenie and Rocky make an es a scapegoat of Mona, accusing him of making a pass at Smitty. Holyface then takes Mona to receive corporal punishment, while Smitty yells after, after them, pleading for Mona not to be taken away. Enraged by the turn of events, Smitty swears to be revenged upon Queenie, Queenie and Rocky, and then turns to the audience, addressing them directly, and promises to be, re be revenged upon them, too. In this moment of direct address, Smitty's fate as a criminal is confirmed, and the fault for his transformation is clearly laid at the feet of Fortune's middle-class audience. The gravity and power of Fortune's critique, especially in its production at the Central Library Theatre, is found in the ways that it posits its realistic representations of the power structure of the prison as analogous to those current in Canadian society. The prison's hierarchy, enforced through physical, verbal, and sexual violence, is ordered into a limited number of predetermined roles. Generals, who are the wardens or the people, the management of the prison, guards or screws, who are the, uh, uh, the guards who run the prisons, uh, run, the, run the, the cells, politicians, old men and their boys, and public property. These roles, much like the economic classes in Canadian society, are hierarchically, hierarchically differentiated by the, their ability to exercise power over others and by their access to material goods. 
The generals are the upper, uppermost level of the prison's formal chain of command, while the guards' screws are their workers, following man management's orders and interacting directly with the inmates. Significantly for Canadian society in the late 1960s, and perhaps echoing Herbert's incarceration experience in the late 1940s, the generals, the wardens, are associated with the fading power of the British Empire, as well as the disciplinary mas disciplined masculinity of the armed forces. The play achi achieves this by assign assigning the higher level prison officials, the generals, English accents, and by aligning them with Canada's British and colonial past. These aspects of the prison's administration are brutally, are, as well as its brutality and its racism, are described in a story told by Queenie. The story describes how the royal, the royal sergeant, that's what Queenie calls him, um, the prison's warden, makes a practice of challenging new inmates to a boxing match, quote, man to man with no interference, as a way to let prisoners know, as a way to let prisoners know who's boss. Queenie's, re, Queenie recounts the horrors that ensued when a young Iroquois man took the warden at his word. Quote, the second he and Bad Bess, Bad Bess squared off at each other, two guards jumped Big Chief running blood, and the three British bully boys beat the roaring piss out of him. Heroes all. Queen's account, Queenie's account of a false proposition made by a British general to an Aboriginal man invokes Canada's history of bogus treaties and broken agreements. While the pleasure, pleasure and fervor with which the three British bully boys mete out their violent aggression recalls the brutus, brutal injustices committed against First Nations people by British and Canadian colonialism. His sardonic description of the story's heroism directly indicts both the hypocrisy of the criminal justice system and the, and the hyperbolic narratives of colonial bravery and courage. Furthermore, the anecdote directly links the criminalization and continued marginalization and oppression of First Nations people in the present with the atrocities of, Canadians, of Canada's colonial past. The connection between, the Canadian, between Canadian society and the world of the prison is also evidenced in the character of Mona. As the only character in the, in the play imprisoned for gross indecency, Mona's status as public property relates to the position of homosexual men in Canadian society at this time. For being true to himself, for not adhering to the predetermined roles of the prison culture, Mona has, has been deemed public property, which le leaves him vulnerable to violent assault. These are also the conditions that openly gay men confronted in, Canada, in Canada before decriminalization. And, and arguably even long afterward. By being open and rejecting compulsory heterosexuality and its attendant roles, one was liable to fall victim to an array of prohibitions, condemnations, and punishments, including incarceration or being subject to therapies of medical authorities without recourse or retribution. The justification of, of these abuses at this time is simply because the person is homosexual and no further rationalization of their abuse or their rehabilitation, rehabilitation seems to have been necessary, as we see demonstrated in the case of George Everett Clipper. This is also the case uh, for Mona's victimization at the hands of the other two inmates. Discussing if Smitty could be a target of a gang rape, Mona suggests, quote, they won't do it to him. He doesn't look gay, and, he probably, and he's probably not here on a sex charge. They felt that I had no rights. Again, she's speaking about the other inmates and the gang rape that she experienced. The justification for Mona's victimization is that he is homosexual on the one hand and public property on the other. In both cases, he has no rights, no means to, pro to protest, no avenue to re for redress, and no vehicle for retribution. Similar, similar to Herbert's actual experience, Mona is imprisoned because a group of boys from his neighborhood were attempting to rob him and then accused him of soliciting sex when, soliciting sex when police arrived and intervened. From Herbert's own life to the stage, the everyday banality of, a homo, of homophobic aggression by a gang of boys is transformed by state intervention into a, an irrevocable incarceration and indelible violence that Mona, like Herbert, is subject to through his incarceration. The injustice of Mona's arrest and, and trial prompts Smitty to propose that he should have had a lawyer. 
Mona indicts the just justice system further when he replies that he did. Quote Mona, Oh, I had one, or did I? Yeah, too late, after he got his money, we saw that he didn't care to tarnish his, reputa his reputation. No real defense, a deal. Magistrate's court is like a trial in a police station, all pals, lawyers and cops together. They threw me on the mercy of the court. Oh Christ, that judge with his hurry up face, hear the neat police evidence and my lawyer's silly sugar quoted plea. So half hearted, I wanted to shout, let me speak, leave me some damn dignity. The fat white haired frown looked down on me, go to jail for six months like I dirtied his hands, and that would wipe them clean. Mona's case boldly names the injustices gay men faced in a society within which the criminal justice system, uh, the, uh, uh, within the criminal justice system at this time. Firstly, Mona's innocent. He was not making, uh, making advances at, at, on the boys. It was rather they who were harassing him. The, judge, the judge's perfunctory sentence and his desire to wash his hands of Mona both express his and the broader culture's desire to rid themselves of such defilement, making Mona's sentence, sentencing more akin to penance uh, for his abnormal gender and sexuality. Mona is thus, is thus far, falsely charged, criminalized, and silenced, and ultimately discarded by a judge and a society who understand homosexual existence through competing discourses of criminality, degeneracy, perversion, sin, and pathology. Secondly, Mona is a scapegoat for the young hooligan's actions. He can find no justice in the criminal justice system. Furthermore, he pl the, furthermore the play repeats the scenario of, of innocence being met with punishment at the play's conclusion, when he is dragged off to be whipped for making a pass at Smitty, which he, in fact, did not make. Mona thus has no rights, no defense, no voice, and no dignity within society and within the criminal justice system because he is homosexual, which automatically incriminates him and denigrates his character. He is rather a scapegoat, there to be used and abused to suffer for the sins of other and to suffer for the sins of others. Finally, as a first-time offender, offender, he will be marginalized because he is a queer and an ex-convict forced to live at the margins of society, as Herbert did. Especially in the production at the Central Library Theatre, because it was staged at the very moment that Everett George Clippard awaited and then received his indefinite sentence as a dangerous sexual offender, Mona is an example of an innocent gay man whose life is ruined by the criminal justice system. In fact, Mona, Herbert, and Clippard are more than just examples of the failures of the justice system. Their stories convey the ways in which gay men were veritable targets, sitting ducks for abuse in the years before decriminalization. And that's uh, the, the actor who played um, Mona in the, in, the, in the production. And so there's, it's significant that in 1967, that the man being, um, which I'm not, I go into my chapter, but I don't have time today, uh, that the man who's being dragged away is an African-American man. So fortunes, Final damnation of the prison system is enacted when Smitty asks Mona if he can be his old man. Mona refuses, explaining to Smitty that he will not partake in a system that, views, that he views as completely corrupt. Mona knows that there is no liberty and therefore no love in the world of the prison. All that exists there is the limited options constrained by circumstances and predetermined roles. Furthermore, the lack of choice means that Smitty and Mona's desire for connection an attribute that is inherent to, to human beings, gay or straight, will be warped in, in, into an inequitable relationship that will inevitably breed resentment and unhappiness between them. So in this exchange between Mona and Smitty, uh, Mona says, um, how do you feel after sex with Queenie? Because that's happening within the play, sex between uh, Smitty and Mona. How do you feel after sex with Queenie? Smitty, I could spit on her. Mona, it would be the same with me. It's not in your nature. Smitty, I came to you, Mona. No, just circumstances. You're looking for a girl, not for me. Smitty, what should I ask you? Should I ask, should I, I ask you to, to do it with somebody else? Keep on being public property? What do you do, make comparison? Mona, I separate. Yes, that's right. I separate things 
in order to live with others and myself. What my body does and feels is one thing, and what I think and feel apart from that is something else. So Mona's rejection of Smitty reveals two important points. First, that Mona's actions, like Rocky's and Queenie's and Smitty's, are his personal strategy for survival within the prison. And second, that the play positions homosexuality as an inherent part of the individual. In this sense, Mona clearly articulates that instead of forming alliances and politicking to potentially ensure his comfort and, and corporal safety, he puts himself in harm's way so that he may remain true to his sense of morality, his sense of ethics, and his identity. When he says that he separates, he communicates his strategy for survival within the prison, making himself as numb as possible to the abuses his body endures in, in order to retain his sense of identity, morality, and empathy. Mona understands, the, that, understands that the roles that one must play in the prison are, in fact, soul-destroying. They pit in, inmates against one another, force them into inequitable relationships, discourage empathy, and one will inevitably transform them into the unethical, unethical criminals that society has deemed them to be. For Mona, the greatest threats of the prison system are the possibility of losing his identity as a moral person or being killed as he fights to save himself. In the second, second case, Mona's argument about Smitty's sexuality, that it is not in his nature to have sex with another man, reveals the, play, the play's minoritizing view of homosexuality and how the prison system deforms sexual desires that it views as inherent to people who are homosexual or heterosexual. Despite the various forms of homosexual sex that are alluded to in the play, Mona's pronouncement about Smitty's nature shows that sex between men who are or who are not homosexual is an expression of the prison's corrupt system. It is neither, it is neither a um, perversion of, it is, it is either, excuse me, it is either a perversion of their natural desires or rape as an expression of power. Sex between men in the prison is always a form of de degradation because there can be no real choice and therefore no real consent. And in the, cr the, the critic's response to the play, it's mostly a, a misunderstanding of the, uh, the, the status of sex, of homosexual sex within, within the play, um, which they, they fail to understand as not about um, mutual respect or desire, but only about um, power. Sex within the play is purely about, uh, about power. When I went to New York to interview David Rothenberg, the, the, the play's produce, producer, you recall, and I told him that I was looking at Fortune as an example of, and that's the scene between, between uh, Smitty and Mona that I was just talking about, as an example of gay theater, of gay, uh, excuse me. When I went to New York uh, to interview David Rothenberg, and I told him that I was looking at Fortune as an example of Canadian gay theater, he more than once suggested that at the time of its production, and even for him today as an openly gay man, the play was not intended to be a gay play. The play was rather a protest against the immoral treatment of people by the criminal justice system, as well as the various modes of social domination of which homophobia and heterosexism are but two variations that are endemic to our society and for which the milieu of the prison acts as a microcosm. This is undoubtedly true. However, included in the play's broad critique of society are homosexual men, which is of particular political importance in the, year bef the years before decriminalization of homosexuality in Canada, and specifically for its production at the Central Library Theater in 1967. This is because Fortune incorporated homosexual men into the, its impassioned plea for legal reform in the years before decriminalization, and through its representation of the injustices that homosexuals and other marginalized people experienced in the criminal justice system and in society generally. By doing so, the play paved the way for the same, types of same kinds of critiques, analysis, and actions to be launched by parts of the gay liberation movement and on Canadian stages in the 1970s. Despite Rothenberg's or even Herbert's intentions at the time, the production at the Central Library Theater provided, in, Cohen's, in Nathan Cohen's words, a look at the, quote, realities of, a society's, of society's subcultures 
and a stunning call for understanding and reform. If the link between what was re represented on stage and the lives of gay men in Toronto was at all tenuous for its audience during its run at the Central Library Theatre, it was most certainly not on the, on the night of Fortune, on the, on the, on the night of Fortune's opening. At its premiere, not only was Herbert present, an openly gay man whose autobiographical experiences were widely known to inspire the play, but Alan Maloney, the ex-con and friend of, of, of Herbert, who he met in Guelph and upon whom the character of Queenie is based, arrived at the theater dressed as his drag persona, Brandy, who we saw a picture of earlier. According to Rothenberg, quote, Brandy was like a star. Brandy came to the opening night in Toronto in full drags and, of course, was thrilled seeing himself on stage in the character of Queenie. He knew it immediately. If there was any confusion that this play sought to highlight the oppression that homosexual men in Canada faced at this time, that it sought to create spaces for the lives of, for the lives of men like Maloney and Herbert, it would surely have been dispelled by, by Brandy's presence. It is perhaps an anachronism to say that Brandy queered the space that night, but her presence would more, more, most certainly have acted as a paratheatrical performance of queer identity, one that undoubtedly echoed Queenie's and Mona's drag performances within the play, as well as, as with the protests it launched against the injustice of criminalizing and marginalizing homosexuals. Brandy's and Herbert's presence as survivors of the criminal justice system and as very out, very angry gay men highlighted the direct relationship between the lives of the characters on stage and the people gathered in the audience. In every aspect of its staging, and most certainly on its opening night, Fortune at the Central Library Theater was a profound, a powerful act of theatrical protest against the criminalization and marginalization in, of gay men in Toronto, in Toronto, Canada, and beyond. Thank you very much.